This is the 35th lecture in a series on single agent search. And in this lecture, we're going to start moving away from our exponential domains that we've been looking at, things like pattern databases and inconsistency and heuristics, although we will actually be looking at some effects of inconsistency. But we're going to move and start looking at polynomial domains and looking at what happens in polynomial domains because uh, much of the maybe traditional literature for heuristic search has been focused on exponential domains and there's actually quite a lot that goes on in the domains that grow polynomially and there's some very interesting problems that occur in that space and so we want to be able to look at those and begin to study those and so um, the first thing we want to do is actually define, well, what is a polynomial domain? Okay, and so a polynomial domain is one that is growing, uh, just as a reminder, let's actually just remind ourselves about exponential domains, exponential. So exponential domains grow as b to the d, where there's a branching factor, of b and a depth of d. And so d is the parameter um, that determines how far we're searching. And so this is the growth parameter. This is a constant and the depth grows. And so in a polynomial domain, what we have is the state space grows as r to the d. And in this space, d is the dimension of the search and r is the radius that we're searching. And so the difference here between an exponential and a polynomial domain, um, here the radius is what grows with our problem size. As our problem gets bigger, we assume the dimension is fixed, the radius grows. Uh, and so instead of here, it's the exponential that's growing. Here it's the base of the exponential, uh, which means it's polynomial as a result. And when d gets really large, then practically speaking, a polynomial domain is very similar to an exponential domain. But there's many, many problems where d is going to be small, for instance, two or three. And these occur particularly in pathfinding in games and in pathfinding in the real world, that is navigation on maps. And there is actually a whole community that for the last 20 years and even longer than that, is focused very much exclusively on how to do pathfinding in real world maps. And there are some really incredible advances that have been found there. And, uh, and specifically what's been found there is that there is just an incredible amount of structure in the way that we build our cities and the way that we build our roads. And given that structure, we are um, then able to take advantage of that. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that in this particular course. We're going to point to some of the results that are there, but, um, but we won't spend as much time as we could on those, even though there is some uh, really interesting work that, that has been done in that space. So we're just going to mostly point in that direction. Um, but we're sort of looking a little bit more broadly at search. And so what I want to look at here is what happens when we try to build heuristics for these domains. Uh, we can have natural heuristics in polynomial domains. <clears throat> so for instance, in a polynomial domain, we often have something like Euclidean distance, which tells us um, you know, how to find a heuristic between two points. Uh, just like in many of our exponential domains, we have things that uh, very naturally can be turned into heuristics. But um, what, what we're going to look at here is how we can actually build more accurate heuristics. And if we remember in our pattern databases that we are building, or basically abstraction-based techniques for exponential domains, that we have this model. And the model says, look, I'm going to have my state space, which was b to the d in size. So that and d was the depth of the search space. And I'm going to shrink that by dividing it by some factor k. So when I abstract my state space, it gets k times smaller. And that's going to give me a new state space. And in that new state space, it's going to be b to the h, where h is going to be my heuristic value. Okay, so this is a model of what an abstraction heuristic does. We are, we are grouping states together using some sort of abstraction function. And, and then we're going to see what happens to our heuristic value. 
And so if we want, then we want to solve for h and ask it what happens here. So remember, if we take the log of both sides, we're going to do the log base b of b to the h. So we're going to get the log base b of b to the d over k. And so what we're going to see here is the log of uh, base b of b to the h is just going to be h. And then the log base b of b to the d is going to be d minus the log base b of k. I uh, skipped a few steps there, but hopefully we remember that from our earlier lecture, or we just remember our properties of logarithms. And so what that says here is that if I have the true distance across the state space, when I do an abstraction, I apply abstraction by grouping some number of k states together, then my heuristic is equal to the original distance minus the log of the factor by which I abstracted the state space. So I could abstract by actually a fairly large factor, and the impact is that I subtract a small number from the distance of the original state space. And in an exponential domain, even small errors in a heuristic can have a huge impact on the number of the amount of work that we have to do to solve the problem. So this isn't inconsequential, but the heuristics here can still be very, very useful in solving problems efficiently. And um, there's a nice paper by Malta Helmert and uh, his co-authors that did win the best paper award at AAAI it's probably 10 years ago or so, looking at exactly what the impact is of even small errors in, in heuristics. But let's look at the same thing. And we can ask the question is, can we use abstraction-based techniques for building heuristics in polynomial domains? And uh, we'll look at this here. And so here we're going to remember, so now um, R is what our heuristic is going to be. So what we're going to imagine is I abstract my state space, and my abstraction needs to preserve the dimensionality. So this is something that's important. We're going to assume that we can do this. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get h is my new heuristic value, h to the d, where d is my dimension, is going to be equal to r to the d, which is my original state, sp state space size, divided by k, where, because I've shrunk it by a factor of k. And we ask what's happened here. Well, we just take the dth root of both sides. So h is equal to r divided by the dth root of k. And so what we see here, what does this mean? Well, so let's just think about if I'm in a, um, let's say that my dimension is equal to uh, four. Uh, well, let's just say it's equal to two. And I want to abstract my state space by a factor of four. Then what happens is the, the heuristic value that I'm gonna get is going to be, and just to say it's approximately equal to, I mean, this is only, um, this is sort of a broad argument and um, I, I have some pictures. Actually, I don't have them for this lecture here, but I can show that this does occur when you do type, this type of abstraction. And we'll come back to that later in the class. Um, what we'd see is that the heuristic value is going to be r divided by uh, the square root of 4, which is 2. Okay. And so if you think about a map, and I build a, uh, you know, two states that are, you know, 100 steps apart, and what I'm going to be getting is a heuristic that says, well, no, they're actually only 50 steps apart. So I'm going to have some, uh, even, even if I have an exact computation of distances in this abstract state space, uh, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, it's going to be um, the, the degradation to the heuristic value is going to be large enough that this isn't necessarily going to be worthwhile in practice. So what this says here is that abstraction-based heuristics are not accurate in polynomial domains. And um, you can do this, though. Like, uh, I'm not going to talk about this here. I did have a work <clears throat> looking at multi-agent pathfinding, actually. This is in I believe 2005, 2005 or 2006 actually, uh, where what we did is we said, well, the abstraction divided the heuristic. Uh, this is before we'd done this analysis. So all we're gonna do is basically use weighted A star, which multiplies the heuristic back up 
and and basically compensates for the the inaccuracy here. And you can do that, but the problem is is that the you're not guaranteed to have admissibility or other properties uh, like that that we might want to have to guarantee optimal or bounded suboptimal solutions. So if we're going to try and do heuristics in a polynomial domain, we're going to want a different approach and something that is going to be uh, able to work more, maybe more tuned for polynomial domains. And there is an approach, or there's a number of approaches that do this. There's quite a few. We're going to start with one that's been given many different names. So uh, in 2001, this is actually introduced in... Uh, in um, networking, they were looking at trying to do network positioning. So uh, Ng and John proposed this. Uh, there's a version that was done in the road network community, combining A star landmarks and the triangle inequality. It was by Goldberg and Har Harrelson in 2005. Uh, we were looking at it again in 2009 as uh, some of the argument that's being presented here is sort of a need for um, abstraction. Or, and, and why we need certain heuristics in polynomial versus exponential domains. Um, and then there's a view of this as these uh, as the type of heuristic I'm going to show next as being um, Euclidean embeddings or Euclidean heuristics. And so we'll be looking at that. And, um, and then there's been another view which is looking at these, or we can build these as sort of additive heuristics as well. So uh, all these people have different names for them and different uses. And so generally speaking, what we're going to be looking at is um, Euclidean embeddings is the most general term. And the, and the, the exact name or maybe the reference I'm going to use is um, being a little bit biased. I'll use some of the work by myself and my students. Um, which we would we call these differential heuristics. I don't particularly love this name uh, for a couple different reasons, but um, I think Euclidean embeddings is actually the proper name for this and for all these approaches because this is the, the it's actually the correct description of what is going on. It's the correct geometric interpretation of what's being done. And so this is the general term is this, but when we want to refer to a specific technique, then we'll use this. And um, so let's take a look at what is going on. And we're going to look at a high level view uh, of what is being done here. And just to say, um, this is similar to alt A star landmarks and the triangle inequality. The differential between here is that this is sort of combining everything together where this is using more of our heuristic search view that we have a heuristic, which is separate from A star. It doesn't have to be A star, right? It could be any, any algorithm that we want to use uh, where we're just building an admissible consistent heuristic. Uh, landmarks is the name that was used for this. Well, sort of landmarks in the triangle inequality. Uh, landmarks is actually a type of heuristic that's used in planning. And so we're sort of left with a triangle inequality. And um, anyway, so, um, so these are both names for more or less the same thing. The only other difference is this is done in a more of a directed way where differential heuristics tend to look at an undirected graph. And so uh, since we're going to look at undirected graphs for this lecture, then we'll call them differential heuristics. Okay, and so the view we're going to look at here is um, since we know that we can't do abstraction-based heuristics, we're, what we're going to need is something that is... Um, that is not abstraction based. And so we're going to do something that we should, what we call true distance. So we want to make, we want to compute true distances in our state space, not abstract distances, but true distances. This term was coined by Ariel Fellner. And uh, true distance heuristics are we're going to use the uh, heuristics based on these distances, and then we'll, if we don't actually have a true distance, we're going to infer it using the triangle inequality. Okay. And so the way this picture that we can start from is we can start from what we'd call all pairs shortest paths. Okay. All pairs shortest paths means if I have n states in my state space, I'm going to have an n by n array. Um, in practice, uh, there are because we're imagining that the state space for at least this part of the lecture, we're going to imagine that it's 
uh, undirected. So we, this, there's some redundant data here, but we don't care so much about this. But this is the all pair shortest path data. And you can imagine for any uh, pair of states, then I can I could just look up in here and it would tell me, for instance, the distance to get to the goal. And this would be a perfect heuristic. And the idea is that um, instead of storing all of this information, which could be uh, quite expensive to store, uh, or might even, it could be expensive to compute. Typically we would say that it's sort of n squared time to compute this and it's n, sorry, n cubed time to, to compute this. We can do better than that uh, often with our assumptions, but this is, we're basically storing all the data inside this table and it's quite expensive to do so. Um, or it may be, depending on your map. I mean, maybe you have small maps and then you can just afford to do this and it's not a problem. So the idea of a differential heuristic, which I'm just gonna call a DH, is that we're going to say, look, let's think about the all pair shortest path data. And we have the same picture that we have N items here and N items here. But instead of storing all the data, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to choose to store uh, very small subsets of this data. And let's see if I can get these lines to look nice. There we go. So the idea is we're gonna choose some portions of this data to store, and we're gonna choose some portions of the data not to store. Okay, it's uh, not a very straight line there, but um, there we go. And so we have some, like for instance, rows and columns here where we would store the data and some where we wouldn't. And so the idea here is we can think of this as a compression of all the, the all pair shortest path data. There's a bunch of stuff we don't wanna store, but there's some stuff we're gonna store exactly. And what does a row or a column in this mean? Well, what this means is that for some particular state here, uh, for some particular state here, what it means is we're going to be storing the distance from this state to every other state in the state space. So whatever states are stored here, we'll store the distance from them to everybody else but we don't store, there could be arbitrary other pairs of states where we don't have, uh, which would look something like this or something like this, where I don't have any information about those pairs of states. And the question is, is given that I have some set of states, in fact, let's just look at one to begin with, could I infer the distance, a heuristic for all states, given that I only have the distance uh, between one state and every other state in the state space? And this comes from the triangle inequality. And the idea here is, is I'm gonna draw it, we'll draw it geometrically and then we can write it down. And then we're gonna analyze a little bit of what uh, goes on here. And so the idea here is, okay, I've got some state space. Uh, it's got some obstacles in it and um, you know some things that are getting in my way, making this to be a hard problem to solve. And um, I have a start state here and I have a goal state and maybe, well, actually I'm not worrying about start and goals yet, so we'll get there. But the idea here is let's just say I have some state and maybe we'll put it right here. We're gonna call this a pivot or it would be a landmark in the other uh, ter terminology, but this is a pivot. And what we're gonna store is we're gonna store the distance from every state to and from because the state space is undirected in this assumption to this state. And the question is, is if I have that information and I have two other states in the state space, so just say I have a state, um, let's draw these in a different color. So I have a state here and I have another state here. Can I infer the distance between these states given that I have only stored the distance between this state so what I have available is this distance and that distance. Can I infer something about that distance? And if we extract out this problem and just draw it abstractly out here, what we have is we have a triangle. Okay, I know this distance. Um, so if I call this a pivot, this is pivot one. We're just gonna call this um, A and B. And so what I know is I know the distance from pivot one to B, and I know the distance from pivot one to A. Then what the triangle inequality says is it says that the, um, basically what we're looking at is that 
you know, this piece plus this piece can't be less than this piece right here. And, um, and so that gives us a constraint that if I know these two pieces, I know the constraint of how long this piece can be. Essentially, we could imagine swinging this point right down onto here. If it was exactly on this line, then we know A to B has to be at least that distance right there. Okay. So in an undirected graph, what we would write this as is the distance from A to B has to be uh, greater than or equal to the distance from P1 to A minus the distance from P1 to B. Take the absolute value of that. And this is going to give me an estimate of the distance between A and B. Okay. And so we can ask a couple questions about this. So we can ask, for instance, is it admissible? And the answer is, well, if our graph is undirected, and so what we see is that if it's undirected and the costs, you know, we, we know these actual costs here, um, then what's going to happen is that, yes, we if we have the shortest path, then we're going to see the triangle inequality being followed, and this will end up with an admissible heuristic. And the question is, and maybe an easier way to see it is actually to be thinking about, is it consistent? Because if we can show that it's consistent, it's also admissible. And so for consistency, what we want to see is we want to see um, for any two pairs of states, we'd like to see that the change is always bounded by the edge cost and the change in heuristic. So, sorry, and just to say, because this is a bound right here, this is our heuristic. So this is just um, inside here, uh, or this would just say this is equal to heuristic of A and B. Okay, heuristic of A and B, so is it admissible? Actually, we see right here by the triangle inequality, it is um, less than or equal to the distance between A and B. Okay, and, um, and then is it consistent? And the answer here is, well, does the heuristic of a state at the goal, so the heuristic from if I'm at a goal state, so heuristic from A to A, is that going to be zero? And it always is because P to A minus P to A is always equal to zero. And then we can ask um, if I if I change, if I go from one state to the next state in the state space, can the heuristic change by more than the edge cost? And what we're seeing here is basically look at how these distances change. The answer is it cannot. So this is also a consistent heuristic. The amount of space that this takes as a heuristic, if we say that there are n states in our state space, then this is going to take um, n entries. And the time is we're going to have to do a search. So we're going to choose a pivot and do a search from there. If we don't look, I mean, in many state spaces, we can get very good data structures so that we would um, not have to even necessarily pay a logarithmic overhead. But basically, if we look at the um, if we look at the time here, the time to build this is going to be n, which would be the number of expansions that we do, for instance, in a Dijkstra search, which would allow us to build this heuristic. And so the only real question that remains here is the question of where to put these pivots. And so what I'm going to do is for this particular um, part of the lecture, I am going to just talk about some of the considerations of what makes good pivots and bad pivots. There is or will be a, um, a link below that has a demo of, of the differential heuristics where you can place them in the world, you can visualize the heuristic values, and there's a little game inside that demo that allows you to uh, compute where we think the um, for different states, which states have the maximum heuristic between them. So that's just something that you can play with to get a better uh, intuition for where, sh where we should be putting pivots. And so what we're going to look at here, what I want to show to finish off this portion of the video, is um, sort of what happens what, are, what, what, what happens here when we put pivots. Okay, so and we'll talk just about a few details about doing this in practice. So the idea here is that um, we're going to have some pivot. We want to choose it. And the question is, where could we put states where we're going to get very accurate heuristics, 
where we, we put states where we get very inaccurate heuristics. So this is my pivot. If we just imagine we have an empty state space, then what a really good case is is something like this, where what happens here is that the path that goes from the pivot to my um, to my state here. So I let's show my path in a different color, or I'm, I'm I'm really indicating about this path here. If this path goes through the other state, then what's going to happen is the heuristic is going to be perfect because this distance minus this distance will be exactly equal to this distance. Okay. So in this example that we're doing up here, we're going to get pretty close to that because the shortest path is pretty close between here and here, and we're going to get nearly perfect heuristics uh, coming from this pivot. Uh, however, there are other cases, and I'll just do this in an, another color to distinguish it. Um, but okay, so our pivot is always going to be in black. Um, actually, and we'll, we'll keep the same pivot but we'll just look at different states. So let's just imagine that I have one state that is here and I have another state that is here. And what happens in this case is that they're both the same distance from the pivot. So going back to this equation, this is the equation of the heuristic. The distance from the pivot is the same, but the actual heuristic between them is actually twice the distance. So here we're off by a factor of two instead of uh, being, you know, instead of just getting our, our complete distance across here, we actually get, well, um, yeah, well, actually we're worse than that, right? Here we have a heuristic of zero. Uh, we, one of these lengths here is off by a factor of two, but between the actual distance, but when we subtract them, then they exactly normalize out and we get a heuristic of, of zero. So what we see is having a pivot that's in between other states is going to work very poorly. And, um, it's going to be much better to have a pivot that is uh, that is sort of far away from all other states than something that is in between all the all the other states. And um, so so we can see that the choice of where to put a pivot here can have a big impact on the um, on your solution quality. And um, and so so we want to think about how we do that. And in the next video, I'm going to show a general technique. We're going to look at some properties of building sets of heuristics here. In particular, they're submodular. And the submodularity and monotonicity of the heuristic values allows us to be greedy with a certain method that will allow us to choose pivots very well. But to finish off this lecture, I do want to say something that's rather important. It has to do with structuring sort of the choices of the different types of heuristics we might want to use or calculation that we want to use. And um, and, and this is very important, and it has to do sort of with fundamental differences between road networks and between um, and between things like uh, games or other problems like that. So in a road network, if you look at what's done there, basically what's been seen is that with relatively small amount of computations, you can get actually a very basically an exact oracle that will give you essentially the all pair shortest path data or something very close to it. And so, so in the road network community, there's been almost entirely a shift to finding optimal paths and you can find optimal paths very quickly. So be, before this was discovered uh, or after this was discovered, basically what they found out is it was faster actually to use their new uh, optimal techniques than search techniques to then use the older uh, suboptimal techniques. But this isn't necessarily the case for all domains. So depending on how many queries we're going to do, depending on how dynamic the state space is, um, of course, road networks can change. There are, um, you know, there's changes to roads, there's construction and other things like that. Uh, depending on though, you know, what the memory requirements are, where this is being run, and many other um, outside parameters will determine whether you should be pre-computing something once and sort of reusing that data over and over again or whether that we should be doing something like a differential heuristic where we might compute this on the fly. Uh, we might um, dynamically build this or use this on an, in an online manner as we, can, as we continue with search or other things like that. And so, um, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of parameters here that would determine whether for one particular application we'd want to use this or not. And so, um, 
we just have to be aware of that and be aware of the assumptions that come with certain domains. And so in particular, there are many um, game-like applications where just it's not feasible to be pre-computing everything in, in the ways it would be done for road networks, like running a road network server. And um, so those are some of the trade-offs we're going to look at. And we will see some of the techniques that can be used that are very effective for, um, for having the all-pair shortest path data or something close to it. Okay. So, um, so if we look at here, just as a summary of what we've seen here is that we, uh, oh, and I, I should say something, I will say something a little bit more. Why is this called the Euclidean embedding? What's going on here is that what we're doing is we're taking the original state space, which may be some arbitrary state space here, which is, you know, very complex with many obstacles and other things like this. And for this arbitrary state space, what we're doing is we're basically reorganizing the state space and we're going to embed it in essentially a one-dimensional line. And so uh, we've, we basically map everything on to distances from one particular pivot. So of course, in our state space, it looks like this. What, we're, what are we doing here? Well, we're mapping these states are getting mapped to the same location, which is why they're getting a heuristic of zero between them. But this is what's going on. We're mapping everything into the state space, which, um, which is just the distance from a one-dimensional state space. It's the distance from the pivot. And so that's, that's why these are called Euclidean embeddings. And, uh, and that's what they're coming from. We can view them as a compression of true distance, the true distances and the all, pass, all pair shortest path data. And they do give us uh, admissible and consistent heuristics, at least so far. And the other thing uh, just to say here is that it is really bad that we get some heuristics of zero. And this is why up in this picture here, we're typically going to be using multiple differential heuristics because the idea is there's different pivot points that, and we're gonna use multiple pivot points, but different pivot points will be strong for different queries. And so by shifting and using different pivot points, then between them, we can get, we can get a, um, a stronger heuristic. And so some points that will be very bad with one pivot point could be very good with another pivot point. And that way with many of these will do, or just even a few of these will be able to cover um, depending on the exact topology of your state space, we'll be able to cover uh, most of the distances in the state space and get them to be as accurate as possible. And so we will look at actually how we should choose our pivots in the next lecture. And then we'll look at things like how we can compress them and other uses and things like that. So we will continue more uh, following up from here.